Good morning. Alan Clements here from Los Angeles, California, United States of America, April 18, 2021. Uh, good morning to you or good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you for tuning in to this ongoing series of talks. Um, if I can introduce you to my new book, I'm quite proud of, Extinction X-Rated. I just got my own copy. This is the 18th talk in a series somehow related to this, this topic of living and dying and confronting the evil with our best. Today's sharing, uh, hey you death, hey you death, you can't steal my heart nor my joy. Hey you death, you can't steal my heart nor my joy. You know, it comes down for me, I was thinking today, these, these conflicting interwoven narratives based upon living, breathing, in the conditioned environment that we find ourselves. On the one hand, there's a worldly narrative and there's a multiplicity of these kind of etymological, conditioned, cultural, social, political, sexual, river narratives that inform us to live a particular way. And we know those particular ways. We see them in our own life, our friends, our family, our synagogues, our churches, our meditation centers, our workshops. Look at the diversity of psychological, emotional behaviors. And those of you who have some inclination to the psychological, the deeper philosophical, the Dhammic, we've studied on a very intimate level, on a cognitive level as well, to some extent, these intersecting narratives. And we all got to that point who, I think, who got ignited by the infusion of the spiritual, the psychedelic, and the dhammic, the existential urge in the human heart that I would call the, the, the desire to awaken, to higher, more radiant, liberating narratives. That narrative for me is the, the narratives of dhamma. And we live our whole life based upon the intersection of these kind of etymological, epistemological, philosophical, spiritual, sexual, financial, interwoven tapestries. It's not really a great tapestry because on the one hand, we're, we're challenging conditions that we know that we've seen their limitation, their denigration to self and other environmentally as well. Here we are on the precipice of the six mass extinction. And beneath that, with that, through that, we understand a more radiant, right? A radiant experiential epistemology, a transformational intelligence that frees us from constricting beliefs. It's just not cool to throw plastics onto the road. It's not cool to, to spit into people's faces. There's an etiquette, an environmental, a spiritual etiquette. And we're learning, as you know, as I know, how to bring forth in our lives, now that we're older, some of us are younger, how to bring forth a higher radiant narrative, right? A more liberating narrative, a, a narrative that considers not just existing human life and non-human life, nature, but also the future of life, not just on this planet. I think it's important to see, you know, to state the obvious, that our mysticism, our dharma, our spirituality, our environmental, our cosmological environmentalism start to exceed the framework of our epoch, our time frame, our planet, our dimension, and to think really truly, not just out of the box, but out of that box too, and that box too, right? You're with me. Thank you for tuning in <laughs> from my heart to yours. Death. Hey, you man. Hey, you girl. Hey, you death. You will not steal my heart, nor my joy. I've got Dhamma resilience. Are you willing to scream today with me? Thank you for tuning in. I've got my young evangelical running through my heart, my blood, my mind today. Vulnerable, open, poignant. There's a big F you that's just careening through my blood today. At the same time, hey, I'm bigger than you, dude. Take me, death, but you cannot steal my heart. Old age, the Buddha talked about, 
disease, illness, death, mortality. Obviously, it's just inbuilt in the cognitive system. You can't escape those, can you? Of course, we turn to spirituality. Dharma was our salvation to say, hey, you, Mr. Illness, although I am in a death moment, we all are, but some more quickly, not really. I refuse to participate in that narrative in the way that you conditioning want me to believe. Right there is where I would call, if you're hanging with me, thank you for allowing me and participating in this spontaneous riff. We need to evoke, I think, our mad woman and our mad man that is in super solidarity with the most domically resilient qualities of the human mind and heart, and of course, domically inspired friendship and alliances and good food and diet if we're so lucky to have those choices. Breathe well and look right into the face of, hey, you, death, and I'm bigger than you. I'm bigger than my oxygen. I'm bigger and deeper, more intimate than my thinking of death as a wrong event. Right there, that narrative. Why in the hell is naturalness wrong? Naturalness to grow old. Naturalness to have a heart attack. Naturalness for a six-year-old to have a tumor. Natu Yes, 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 you've got to be so politically, spiritually correct that you always have to err on the side, right, of being human. Alan, you just can't be a blunt ocean madman, can you? Can any of us really rise to that more radical, artistic, theatrical, uncompromising, vulnerable wake-up call that says, hey, you know, I'm going to cry all the way, but you cannot take my heart. You can't take my joy. You cannot take the refuge of my existence. You cannot take my dhamma. You can't take my intelligence. You can't rape that part of my heart. No way, God. No way, Bible. No way, Jesus. No way, devil. No way, Satan. No way, evil. No way, me. I'm not going to participate. Non-collusion, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Take refuge. Pause. I don't want to learn how to be complicit with spiritually, psychologically, psychedelically infused, hip, cool, chic narratives. This is the time to break, right? Break out, man. The boys and girls in Burma are breaking out. They're giving us a vision of courage. Break out. There is no evil that we can't confront, right? Easy to say, Alan, from way over here in the comfort of Santa Monica on a beautiful sunny day. You gotta be human, Ellen. Your narratives have to be humble. You just can't break out in the prose of thinking that what you say is true. You gotta be very sensitive to the impact of what you're suggesting. I don't suggest anything to you. My battle is my battle. I've been fraught with mistakes, but today, hey, you death, you can't take my heart. You can't take my joy. Sometimes I cry that little poignant place in the human spirit that just wants what you want, that you think you want when you want it. Right there, the prose and the poignancy and the poetry and the madness all congeal right there in that little tender moment of the soul and you cry you don't even know why sometimes which is just so beautiful and crazy remember the Dalai Lama talking about his hero in Tibet he called him the weeper a man who cried in the face of suffering and the Dalai Lama at the end of his long exhortation on the virtues of this man he said he, ins he was an inspiration because he could at least cry in the face of suffering and death and old age and pride and arrogance and evil. Although he couldn't really act, he was somewhat paralyzed in his emergence of compassion through tears, but empathy was there. But why he's my hero is that at least he can cry. I rarely cry. 
in the face of suffering. Hey, you death. Hey, you old age. Hey, you rape. Hey, you genocide. Hey, you evil. How many of us have spent time around those timeless burning ghats in Varanasi, in Calcutta, in Delhi, anywhere in our own city streets, where we just sat there and listened and felt the timeless radiance of looking and feeling and smelling burning flesh just peeling back like phyllo dough from the bodies of these beautiful beings that once for minutes before led a very perfectly healthy life and just, you know, the lightning bolt of the existential reality of no moment is safe from the sickle of evil or death or old age or the surprise of a stroke, a heart attack, a death sentence, tick tock, tick talk, the doomsday clock, always on a fuse, burning towards the inevitable right here and right now, all these narratives colliding. They're not in the future. They're always present, right? I was thinking before I sat today just of this ancient story of, I think her name was Gotama, Gotami. She was said to have married young in ancient India, according to the Sutta. And a beloved child died early in his life, and she was bereft, imagine. And she walked through the village crying, please, someone help me bring my child back to life. Imagine that's you, <laughs> me. Bring, who would not want your child back to life? How hard it would be sometimes or that it is to, to face the inevitable reality. Hey, death, you took my beloved. You took the very life force that came through my womb just years before. Now you have placed it on the altar of the mystery. And they tried to talk to Gotami and said, death is natural. No one can bring your child back to life. But she was not willing to listen to that. And eventually, after four or five people, someone said, there's a man in the forest with a member of men and women called a Sangha. He is said to be wise. Go to him. His name is Buddha, formerly Gotama. And she went. And as the Sutta decides, she said to the Buddha, my son has died. They say that it's possible that you can bring my son back to life. Imagine that. It sounds insane, right? But so epic, so beautiful. And the Buddha said in this text, go to me, if you can go to a home and find someone who has not known death in that family, that household, please bring back a mustard seed to me and I will bring your son back to life. And so as the story goes, go to me went home to home I want to put myself into her mind and body, home to home with my daughter. I want to bring my life back to life. I want to bring my child back to life. Is there someone in this home who has never known death? And they say, no, our uncle died last month. And home to home, an aunt died, a son died, a daughter died, a grandparent died, a friend of a friend passed away. 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 20, 30 homes. And eventually, as that process of an entire life went by, the dawning, the awakening, the Dhamma awakening, the Dhamma resilience, the, the, the challenge to the contraband to a narrative that death and old age and disease is somehow to be feared. Her mad woman became alive in the fire, the radiant of her wisdom, and she went back to the Buddha and said, it said with a smile, I could not find the seed, but I found myself. There is nowhere safe from death. And the Buddha announced her as mad woman to meet mad man in an existential fire that confronted the narrative of the conventional. Now, isn't that the issue? Hey, you death, you can't steal my heart. You can't take my joy. Just think of all the ways that we empower 
outside, other, the phenomenology of up and down, good and bad, ugly and beautiful, rich and poor, all the ways in which we are dealing with the, 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 um, the confrontation to these ancient narratives embedded in this existence called life. Isn't that the biblical, the spiritual, the nuministic, the existential, the psychological, the deep intuitive, psychic intuitive wisdom, resilience of Dhamma to liberate ourselves as much as humanly possible from these existing narratives, all the while, of course, being tempered by being human and real and intimate. But there's a part of us, I don't know about you today, and I'll close with this, there's a part of me that refuses as I increase in the face of these inevitables, I'm not going to participate in these narratives. You're not going to steal my joy. You're not going to steal my heart, life. I'm going to take this higher. You're going to take this higher if you so choose. May I invite you to rise up on this shared journey. We can't do it without each other. Internalizing Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Isn't that what we're called to do? It's so obvious, but yet it's so unobvious. The deep internalization of these timeless thoughts as nutrients of a higher order resonance of an intelligence, a spiritual intelligence, a psychological intelligence that isn't just conventional bound, but it deals with the trans-dimensional Another very interesting discourse attributed to our friend Gotama, the Buddha. Rare indeed is it to meet, as it's been said in this ancient text, rare indeed is it to meet someone who hasn't been formerly your mother, your brother, your sister, your uncle, your aunt, your lover, your partner, your son, and probably your enemy, your nemesis, your all the variations on human interaction. But imagine right now, you know, how easy it is to empower without even knowing narratives that allow us unknowingly to feel the angst, the struggle, the low grade, the high grade depression, that life isn't the way it is or is it the way it should be. I'm alone. And I'm somehow doing my best, but it's, it's enough, but not enough. And right there, calling on our samsaric allies, our samsaric sangha, the boys and girls that we meet everywhere we go to see beyond the appearances, beyond the ordinary, beyond the conventional narratives, and understand that we're in this together. And a second strata, pause, reflect in the gratitude, part of the soul for me of Dhamma resilience, is the deep reflection, especially for me right now, I'm feeling it, on the beauty, the unthinkable beauty of, of special alliances, special Dhamma-oriented friendships. I am who I am because of them through them, with them. And right there, calling upon the forces of one's own family to help support, hey, you death, hey, you, you cannot steal my heart, you can't steal my joy. I belong to a tribe of mad women and mad men unwilling to participate in the narratives of compromise and collusion and complicity. You can take all the loot and all the money that you need, but you can't steal my joy. You can't steal my heart, right? Look at the boys and girls in Burma today. They're fucking persecuting them, assassinating them. They're torturing them and they're saying, hey, you man, hey, you Mr. Evil and Napido, you can't steal my heart. You can't steal my Dhamma. You can't take my revolution. You can't take my freedom. We've got examples. And it all happened within eight weeks from ordinary, weird ordinary, Da Aung San Suu Kyi's somewhere in a villa, a home, a prison, we don't know exactly. Wherever she is, she's in her mind, probably doesn't even know about this, this evil so-called coup d'etat. 
all these variations, all these variations on death, old age, disease, crisis, uncertainty, unpredictability, and yet within it, where do you take refuge, Alan? How many times my teachers would emphasize, Budang Saranangachami, Damang Saranangachami, Sangang Saranangachami. Take deep refuge, deeply internalize the transformational intelligence of your understanding of the applied Buddha. Awaken as priority, confront the narratives of the convention. I just love that so much. I never belonged, have you? I tried. I still at times give it a go to be normal, engage, to be semi-invisible, barely, 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 try to make music and dance and love. But somehow it's just like, this is a weird ass party, man. Yes, it's got a few moments, but boy, oh boy, I don't want to be in a gulag in Burma or in Libya or in Syria. I don't want to have an amputated leg, a loss of both parents and friends and lover. I don't want all that shit. And yet here we are, go to me, going house to house. Have you ever known anyone who's never experienced suffering? Have you ever known anyone who hasn't lost a friend? Have you ever known anyone who hasn't had someone murdered? Have you ever known someone who's never heard of the word genocide? Oh my God, isn't that the seed, the core, the pulse of the mad woman. And I think that's important today. Mindfulness is not enough simply to assuage the momentary struggle. It's the radicalization of the internalization for me of Buddha Dhamma Sangha, the modernization of the radicalization of the internalization of the intelligence of the Dhamma. We are a living, breathing, emoting expression of timeless Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Got it. Got it. That's the narrative. That's the refuge. And within that, Alan, empower the uniqueness of your expression. Stop blending in in any way. Speak your heart, your mind, cry, authenticate the realization of your own understanding of an evolutional Nibbana, an unconditional wave rather than arrival at a state, all in a permanent flow. Ride the Nibbana wave and like a snowflake, infinitely forming, dissolving, reforming. Free ourselves from narratives that constrict and conflict, denigrate, persecute. Wherever you are, as I close today, I don't think it's fair for any of us and certainly not appropriate for me to put a title like, Hey, you death, without saying hello, I love you and goodbye. When you talk and feel into the incessant, incessant certainty of transition. And to heighten the luminosity of the most beautiful qualities that are metaphored in the human heart. For me, the 10 timeless radiant paramis, the qualities on my inner Dhamma palette, truthfulness, Love, kindness, freedom, beauty. To put it out there, to, I guess what I'm trying to say here, stumbling, is Play so high stakes with your mad woman, your mad man. Your high stakes with your mad man and your mad woman. That you're willing to 
be the most beautiful, loving being you can with the people that matter to you. And primarily, this is it for me, primarily with yourself. I know this is really, this is really hard for me to say. It's very easy to empower other as priority to self. There's an innate responsibility to that condition, that narrative. For me right now, it's, it's really all about what, what is really true for me. I, I, there's something in that that is so radically empowering to you are the you are the holder of your dignity you're the holder of your truth you're the holder of your grace your liberation you're the you're the architect of your space and to live in that and navigate that with as much fearless grace as possible and so Thank you for being in my life. Thank you for participating. Thank you for your joy, your insights, your giving. And at the same time, um, hey, you death, I will not let you take my heart nor my joy. So from my heart to yours, thank you for tuning in. And uh, I hope to see you tomorrow. Have a great day.